what's up guys today we got a little bit something different for you we got david desero here he runs a channel but you know what let's introduce him all right david Hi, what's I'm going david. on hey what's up i'm david desero i have a youtube channel under the same name i talk about a variety of different fantasy stories but my absolute favorite to get into is grimdark and that's why i'm here today we're going to talk about a really excellent grimdark novel yeah absolutely so uh david is actually one of the only other guys i've actually seen a review for this book up you read it last year mm -hmm. um right yeah around october yeah okay. I, don't, I haven't seen a lot of reviews for this yeah, and, for honestly, for as critically acclaimed as it is for, you know what I mean, for within the subgenre, I was actually pretty surprised with how little like YouTube presence it had. So yours was yeah. like maybe the only review I've seen for it so far. Yeah, I think so. I haven't really seen any others. When you finally reviewed it, then I was like, oh, there's another one. And that yeah. was pretty much it <laughs> yeah, which is I sad <laughs> because so, it's a really I mean, good book <laughs> yeah so if you guys are wondering what book we're talking about of course we're talking about the court of broken knives by anna smith spark now she is deemed the queen of grimdark and after reading this book i would say that that's a ju like justified moniker for her uh what would you say absolutely i agree 100 queen of grimdark when i read this uh, a lot of times things get labeled grimdark and you read it and it's like well these are a lot of these people aren't that bad and the world isn't that bad. This a, a baby literally gets stabbed. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's what you're getting into. <laughs> like, yeah, it's pretty dark. It's, it gets it, into it. it. It starts out that it like starts and ends that way. It's there's no like real moment where, <laughs> where you feel safe. <laughs> it's no. pretty nitty gritty from beginning to end. David and I are going to kind of get into some stuff about the book. We will keep it spoiler free for those that are still, you know, the have yet to read it. Uh, so we'll do that for a little bit. But we also have spoiler free videos, uh, you know, reviews for the book, which I'll encourage you guys to go out and watch those. I'll put a link in the description for both of those. Um, but yeah, I mean, we'll talk about that stuff for a little bit, but then ultimately we want to get into the nitty gritty. We want to get into the spoilers uh, and just talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, all that stuff. And then maybe finish up with some predictions for book two, as we are both planning on pushing forward into the series. So, I mean, as far as trying to keep this thing spoiler free for those out there wondering about getting into the book, what is something that you would sell them on spoiler free? Just like what's a, what's a glaring uh, pro of the book? Okay, there's one POV character in particular who is, if you're a fan of the Broken Empire trilogy, there is a very Jorg-like character in this story. So if you enjoyed how chaotic and violent he got and every scene was exciting because you have somebody like that, there's a character like that in this book. But also the prose. This is, it's dark and violent, but really poetic. Like I, I rarely see prose like this. Anna uh, Smith Spark is actually just excellent when it comes to the poetic writing style. So if you're into that, I highly recommend this book. <laughs> yeah, actually, I would agree with you. I think that there is, uh, you know what I mean? If you, especially if you were into Jorg Ancrath in Prince of Thorns, like that very like just unhinged version of him. Yeah, I think that there is a character in here that you can get behind and will enjoy for all that dark and dastardly nature that, the, you know, the characters are. Um, as well as, yes, her prose is something I noticed that was different. Um, it, it had this crazy flow and it, it hit me with imagery in a different way than a normal, like, writer's prose. Um, so, yeah, it was something that that was so, something that really wanted me to spark this like, you know, don't mind the pun, but wanted me to spark up this fucking conversation because it's like, man, this is a writing style that is different. You will feel that. And but I do think it's also going to be kind of controversial just in how people will like receive it, I guess. Like, I do think there are people that are going to applaud this style. And I think there are going to be plenty of people condemning it at the same time. Absolutely. I think, I mean, just touching again on the pros, it's an experience, you know, it, it's something uh, you don't get with every book and it will 
turn some people off for sure. Uh, I think just the level of violence and things like that. If you're a fan of horror or if you're like a grimdark veteran, you're used to things like that, you'll love it. If you're into the more traditional fantasy where heroes are good, <laughs> this uh, might cause some issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I could agree with that. Uh, we can, I guess I could touch on just briefly maybe how the story's broken up because it feels like the there's the first third of the story really feels like almost, I don't want to say a heist movie, but there's a job and these mercenaries have to do the job. And you see through multiple POVs, you see the politicians behind the scenes who are kind of scheming. And then you see from the mercenaries perspective and how they're going to carry out this job. That's the first third. Then the right. second third is more of, I want to say a love story, but also a fantasy adventure where they're, you know, traveling from small town to small town and get into stuff <laughs> without saying spoilers Right, And then the last third is just a descent into madness. <laughs> it's Absolutely. an entire story. And yes. without you know, giving details on it, but that's how it's kind of broken up. And that's what you're getting yourself into when you read The Court of Broken Knives. That's actually a great spoiler-free breakdown of the story structure, honestly. Um, and Because you could also kind of like, as you're getting into it, you might just kind of be tricked into the fact that you think that you're just kind of on this little mercenary expedition and that's what the whole book's mm -hmm. going to kind of be but it is much larger than that the scope actually opens up like like you said it, it becomes this like three-part story and uh yeah i think there's more to it there's more meat on this story's bones than some people might think you know what i mean some people might just think yeah. it's a, just a weird poetic dark and dastardly tale which i mean it mm -hmm. is to some extent but there's also a lot of, like i said a lot of meat on the story's bones all right so let's just you know what i mean i feel like we can only give so much but <laughs> right <laughs> but it's like spoiler like, free stuff okay <laughs> like realistically this whole discussion, this is for the nitty gritty, man. I mean, I, this is the stuff I really want to get into. Yeah. So we'll just do the spoiler warning from here on out. Uh, everything we're going to talk about is going to be, you know, revealing, you know, like spoilers on characters and plot points, and all that jazz. Uh, we're going to get into, you know, conspiracy theories, putting on our tinfoil hats and all that stuff. So just, you know, you have been warned. <laughs> yeah. If you haven't read it yet, go read it. And yeah, then come absolutely. Back. It's worth it. I feel like it's definitely worth your time. Absolutely. That being said, right. all right. <laughs> so one thing I so the first thing I want to get into, let's just get into it. Like uh the way this story opens up, right? You have that perspective of the soldier in the god Amarath's army but we don't really know what that all really entails. We just know it, it's right now it's violent and visceral and grimy, dirty as fuck, right? Like getting hit with yep. the entrails and the smells of shit and just, you know, the war chants and death, death, death. It's, yeah. it's a lot, right? I mean, like you're getting hammered with a, this just, it's very intense to say the least. What would you yeah. say? Early on, you can tell right away with the visceral description of just blood and guts and, Within the first chapter, you know what you're getting yourself into to some extent. I mean, right. it doesn't, you know, but you can tell this is going to be dark and violent. And right away, you know, just just with the prose itself and the way Anna Smith Spark describes things, it, it's just, yeah, talking about the entrails and the blood and everything like that. And then as soon as you get even in the early chapters to Amrath, you're like, who is this character? Is this is this the big villain? And you don't really know that this is the timeline is kind of put all over the place. And right. this is looking back at this god, king, emperor, monster <laughs> that's just wiping people out. And it's just like, and the way she talks about Amrath is so like, it's like praising his greatness. And it's just right. like, what am I reading? This is intense. <laughs> yeah, and it def yeah, it definitely creates a level of mystery right out the gate, which obviously is something that this book just contains from beginning to end we're just kind of there's always a shroud of mystery around a character or around you know a plot point you know uh you know some kind of betrayal there's we're kept in the dark and kind of slowly shown light but definitely right out the gate like you're saying it's just like kind of not knowing what's going on and it's but it's intense you're just like who who the fuck is amarath 
it, but right yeah. now it's just so chaotic. It's hard to even like focus on who this guy is because it's also like war, you know? Yeah. I think the, the beautiful, beautiful chaos is a good description to the beginning of it. Cause you just, you're just kind of understanding like what is happening. Merit that first you think, Oh, he slayed a dragon. This is a very typical fantasy thing. He's going to be the hero. He's going to save the day. He's, you know, that, that kind of uh that farm boy that has a secret heritage or something like that. You know, you don't, at the time he's just a mercenary and it's like, he slayed a dragon. Oh, he's, he's going to be important. Yeah. And then, <laughs> from there, things kind of unravel. <laughs> yeah. And that's definitely, so this is a, the next thing I really want to get into is that dragon. Uh, right. Because you coming off of that bloody like prologue, we very quickly get into a gigantic, like battle fight you know what i mean with a fucking dragon right yes. like we we haven't even had time to really get to know our fucking players yet and they're already fighting for their lives in a very badass battle and the way that whole mm -hmm. deal goes down was great i loved every minute of that whole dragon scene uh and just you know the chaos the death like stamping out the fucking dude you know just snuffing mm -hmm. out his life yeah it's and, like we barely got to know these people yeah, and there's yeah. a dragon killing off you know a lot of these people that we barely got to know yeah <laughs> like, it's oh, like I wow the <laughs> stakes are being set high right out mm -hmm. the goddamn gate and yes yeah. once again kind of rolling into that mystery right like we just met merith and you know he just we don't really like you said, we're kind of we could get that like farm boy chosen one, maybe vibe or something going mm -hmm. on because he's he straight up kills a dragon. <laughs> and, and yeah. really, you know, <laughs> from what we know of him before that, all we knew was that he was the pretty new boy <laughs> yeah. in the crew. Here's the guy some... that stuck out like a sore thumb and moped mm -hmm. and seemed to be, you know, conflicted and tortured over something internally. Uh, and yeah, then you see... he fucking kills a goddamn dragon. And this yeah. is all like within like 10 pages. Yeah, this is, I mean, things happen fast. And, and it's like a dragon's already stomping on people at this point. You know, where do we go from here? But then <laughs> the fact that Merith is this kind of pretty boy, it almost sets up that fantasy trope even more. You know, here's this young, good looking guy and all these hardened mercenaries. They can't beat a dragon. But here's this pretty boy that comes out and slays the dragon. And it's like it's really I feel like it leans into that stereotype at first. And then, then you get hit with the misdirection and <laughs> oh yeah later. Yeah, yeah, because Merith definitely takes a turn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so let's okay. So there we, you know, that's the one thing though, right? So this book starts out crazy with a bang. And if you're like a grim dark junkie, you know what I mean, like me, like this thing was, you know, through the roof, had my, you know, interest and it just had my attention. Uh, but, and then, but rolling off of that, I have to say that like the pace makes a huge change when we switch, you know, from that pro the bloody prologue and the, the dragon slaying with Merith and Tobias. And then now we're into Orhan's like perspective and it, this really sets up all that political intrigue stuff, but it will also really slow the pace down because it's not, this is not the sword swinging, you know, crazy, uh, you know, in your face, bloody weird visceral shit it's you know a slow burn shit is being built and yeah. you're kind of we, getting the the context of the stuff that's that you've kind of already read about because you really don't know much about the mercenaries and then now all of a sudden you're starting to see the tie-ins and uh you get to understand that maybe noble life isn't you know all that it's cracked up to be you know but this this part for me was like at first this honestly was like slowed it down. I was kind of bored at first. It took me a minute to get into the Orhan like perspective. Uh, yeah, how no, did you absolutely. feel about all that? So it's crazy because you go from this, you know, killing dragons, this cool fantasy adventure that you think you're going on. Oh, man, they're going to have a lot of adventures. And then you get hit with the, the very Game of Thrones esque, you know, po politicking behind the scenes. And it shows the nobility, basically, and the people who run the city. And it's like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna watch this guy go to parties now. And it's like we just watched a dude slay a dragon, and now we're gonna talk about this guy's home life. And it's like, <laughs> <Yeah>. huh? <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, I guess. And then it's just like, yeah, I definitely wanted to. I almost want to you know, speed through that part and let me get back to the good stuff. Yeah, it's it was well, that's how I you know I try to kind of like understand that not everything has to be a you know a michael bay film you know <laughs> explosion yeah, absolutely you know just crazy shit like let mm -hmm. you know try to soak it all in for what it is but 
well, for whatever reason, like I, you know, she just set such an enormous pace and just pulled off so much crazy shit so quickly that it was just like, oh man, I just want to get back to that crazy shit, yeah. you know, stuff. <laughs> like, I think especially towards the end of, of that first act, like it gets more interesting as you see, you know, the job, they, they actually break into the palace and all that yes. and leading up to that. It ramps up and then you start, you realize like, okay, these are the important pieces behind the scenes so I can get the broader scope of what the story is about and why the mercenaries are even there in the first place mm -hmm. and how much all these, um, these guys on the council are trying to screw each other over and everybody's, you know, vying for power. And so it's like, it helps get the broader picture, but especially early on, it's kind of like, well, what, why am I reading this guy's perspective? And yeah. This? It's a jarring <laughs> like change of pace, but mm -hmm. I do like feel like the longer you, if you just, don't give up because, <laughs> because no, no, no. obviously, like you said, towards the end of that, like first, it's just like, everything starts to speed up and click and you're like, okay, yeah, okay, there's this bigger picture. You know what I mean? I was just kind of focused on this one thing and we're already done with that. Mm -hmm. We're moving on now. Right. And it's, yeah, it opens up, yeah. which really uh -huh. like, um, I want, do want to kind of go into then like the Thalia, uh, perspective. I was just about to say that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, cause Thalia's perspective I thought was really cool. Cause this also for me, like we get a first person perspective, you know, like we get all kinds of like, you know, like third person, first person, even like an omnipresent like kind of deal at times throughout this book, which I thought was really cool. But it is kind of nice to like when you get that first person of Thalia, it's like, man, like you, it's it's that struggle with faith almost. You know what I mean? She's a good person. She is a good person, uh, but yeah. she's like, you know, kind of like Mother Death there in Sorlos, you know, like the mm -hmm. high priestess that kills people, sacrifices and, you know, finding conflict with that over time. What was yeah, your uh, feelings, thoughts and feelings on Thalia? Thalia, I think um, to agree, it's like she seems like the good person, right? I mean, she has to still kill people. She has to her own friend. She has to, you know, cut her hand off, remove her eyes because it's part of their laws. But it's like everything she does, you see why she does it. It's not like other people in the story who kill people just because they really enjoy it a lot. She doesn't. She doesn't want to kill these children that she has to sacrifice. And I think jumping into her perspective, being the first, uh, first person POV, it makes it seem like, are we, is she the most important one? Is, are we seeing this through her eyes? Like the story, is she going to be the moral compass of right. the story or the closest thing to one? And I think a lot like uh, Orhan's story with the, the politics, the first couple chapters that I read of her, I was kind of like, mm, it's a little slow, but then pretty quickly it speeds up and you go, oh, okay. She, there's, she has to deal with a lot of right. really intense situations and it, it gets really enjoyable. Right. I honestly, like one of the more, sinister things in this book which i mean there are a lot of bad you know I mean, honestly like you just you know all of merith's parts are pretty pretty dark <laughs> um but one of the darkest things in this book was i feel like when they take thalia from her you know from sorlos when she basically is kidnapped by the crew and you know, the the little girl that's supposed to have 10 years to to like kind of train and fill Thalia's place is now kind of forced into the high priestess position. So you have this little like kid who is now like having to complete these like sacrificial rituals. And it's like literally breaking this young mind because it's just too much. You know what I mean? And they're yeah, like, she's like five. <laughs> it is just like, dude, that shit was so like, just thinking about that really fucked with me. You know what I mean? I got little kids and stuff. So just, I've tried to wrap yeah. my head around my five-year-old yeah, daughter, so uh, having to <laughs> sacrifice. Just people. imagine Tom. Okay. Well now you have to, you know, make the daily sacrifice here. Yeah. You, you hand them a knife and you say, go get it. Okay, and it's honey, just like, go kill that guy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, like you know we know that it's like that the, the child is not ready for it because we get that no. whole bits that's just like how it's mm -hmm. completely traumatizing and breaking down uh the girl's psyche and just it's so fucked up and dark like that that was probably one of the most disturbing things to me of, uh, <laughs> throughout the book and then uh anna smith spark doesn't shy away from it either she no. she'll go like to make you 
to grab the reader's attention and just make you focus on this part, she makes uh, Thalia sit down and have a conversation with her superior or, you know, I forget the guy's name, but he comes down and basically tells her, you need to make this kid do this and kind of really forces it on her. And they talk about it. And she's like, the kids, you know, they're doing the best they can. And to just have that conversation really bring your attention, like they're arguing about it. And it's like, why is this even an argument? You know? Yeah, it's so but, it's so dark and fucked up, but it's great. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's, I, I appreciate like uh, an author bringing that kind of just dastardly nature to a, to a story. You know what I mean? Cause yeah. it really hit home for me. Like I said, that's not that I revel in it. Like, mm-hmm. Oh, it's just so beautiful. <laughs> I make jokes, you know what I mean? But still like, yeah, yeah. I, I don't mind. I like, like when I get hit in the stomach, you know what I mean? Or it just, it's like soul crushing almost like that's awesome, man. Like I feel like yeah. she did a and- great job at creating something that was really fucked me up, I guess, reading it. Mm-hmm. And even from a world building perspective, it's, it's a great detail because you understand the mentality of the city they're in. Right. This is a place where this is expected. This is, you know, this is just the daily expectation. This is your job. This is what you do. That's how Sore Lost is. And it's just. It's Richest city in the empire. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> oh man so i guess you know we're kind of skipping a bit like tobias let's get into the tobias oh. character because tobias is the captain of the mercenary squad you know we meet him pretty much right out the gate right after the prologue he's leading them through the desert to sorlost um and he's our guy that's kind of like oh something's not right with merith you know and that relationship yeah. between those two throughout the book is one that obviously evolves devolves you know is all, a bit all over the place um what how do mm-hmm. you feel about tobias as a character i felt like tobias especially in that first act it felt like he was one of the most important character yeah you know, he was leading leading the charge leading this group of mercenaries and you know he was he seems like a good guy in comparison to other people in that world. Right. But even him, he planned on having most of his men get killed so he can get paid more money and leave like during that mission. And it's like, so even the the guys that are like, Oh, this guy's pretty reasonable. They're fucked up. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) I do feel like that's, I feel like she delivers Tobias in a way because the way you're getting him and Merith at the same time, it's easy to look at Tobias and be like, well, okay, he's the guy, the good, the good one, like, or the one with a moral compass. And he's He's the reasonable guy. (laughs) Yeah. He's the logical one going to keep this kind of, you know, runaway train on track. Um, but mm-hmm. the further you kind of go get through the story, you're like, fucking Tobias is not a good dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you want to touch on that yet, but <laughs> yeah, I had some moments where I was like, God damn it, Tobias. <laughs> yeah. He became grimier in a way, like the, the further we got through the story, especially in the end. He mm-hmm. definitely it was like in a way, I guess I'm almost confused about Tobias's motivation at the very end. Because yeah, he no, be like was, condemning Maris and then following him, and it was like I was like he had every opportunity to just fuck off and leave. He had right. his money. He he sold him out. Go go retire like he dreamed about. But for some fucking reason, he just has to follow Merit like a moth to the flame. He just right. needs to go wherever and just I don't know if he needs to see how this turns out. If he thinks he has some moral obligation to stop him. Or yeah, just, it's, it's strange just right curious. it's there because you don't i feel like you don't get the the context of the any the motivation behind what the fuck he like why are you doing this tobias like i thought you were like you know, like you said you have he had all the opportunity and that's what it seems like his motivation is is to take that opportunity get rid of fucking merith you know wipe his fucking hands clean of the whole crazy situation and then just you know disappear and but he doesn't. He gets back into the fray for no fucking reason. It definitely doesn't better his mm-hmm. situation, which no. is really kind of it's kind of funny in a way. Like, I don't know, like if Tobias is a cautionary tale or what. But there is some comedy like in the irony of how he ends up. You know what I mean? Um, which definitely like makes me what like interested and intrigued and excited mm-hmm. for book two to see like how the situation with to- Tobias ends up. Yeah, and it's like he ends up on the front lines in this war, and it's like, dude had every opportunity to live his dream. He, right. he saved up all that, you know, he had the money, and and now it almost makes me think that 
the author is just putting him there just so we have another perspective to kind of see how Merith is fucking things up, right. I guess, just to put him there. And so we can see the other side of the battle and maybe that's it. Maybe it's just a strategy because <laughs> we didn't really have a perspective from his father's side of the army and things like that. Right. Maybe that's it. That's my guess. Yeah. It's a tough one. I, I'm hoping to see like, like I said, how it all kind of, plays out uh but i do feel like if i there's scott i do for whatever reason feel like there's something going on between tobias and merith like you said the moth to the flame thing there's something going on and i don't know if there's whatever connection if it's you know magical blood or whatever um yeah. there, there's something going on between those two they are their fates are like intertwined maybe just as much as his like anthalias because mm -hmm. Uh, definitely towards the end like let's get into that because there is that thing that a lot of us will call insta love you know like yeah, uh, yeah, in yeah. this book you know mm -hmm. between maris and salia right like they fall in love pretty goddamn quick just yeah. like that as pretty soon as quick. he sees her well okay so here's the cool part i think because they both have these uh supernatural abilities to basically attract people to them mm -hmm. Merit has the demon king blood that makes everybody kind of worship him and praise him and all this. And then she has this ability as a high priestess to kind of change to purposely, she can control hers, I think much better than Merith can probably control his, but she has this ability to kind of change the way people feel about her. Like she, she kind of turned on her charm when Merith was around because she wanted somebody to help her. And so they both see each other. And I think they both have this magnetic, magical force that kind of brings people to them anyways. And it locked to each other. I think that's why I'm okay with the insta love in this one. <laughs> yeah, I even mentioned like, yeah, in my review, I'm like, there is a connection. There's a mm -hmm. connection. Like, it's not completely out of the fucking nowhere, but it's still, it's mm -hmm. very, it is immediate. But there's like, I mean, she did give you kind of something to, to like you said, to just be okay mm -hmm. with it. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't have a problem with this. It's like, yeah, like, any other. Any other book, I'd be like, bullshit. <laughs> I, <laughs> like, I mean, I'll guys. mention it still. But, you know, I feel like it needs to be mentioned. Yeah. Because I know that there will be people always in the comment like, oh, the fucking insta love, you know? So it's like, gotta gotta be objective enough to be like, look, I it didn't bug me enough to take me away from mm -hmm. the story, but it's there. Yeah. It's, you know, it is there. It's like, it's like that thing. Uh, you can hate any specific trope you want, but if it's done well, it's enjoyable. <laughs> right. I mean, and like slowly throughout execution. the book, it's like you kind of start like, because once again, you know, Merith is just that mystery man, you know, tortured soul, em Grim, mm. Grimdark's emo kid. And then like... Just brooding uh, all the time. Yeah, <laughs> then, <laughs> but but oh, uh, no. you know, we start to start to understand more and more about him, right? Like as along with like the world's lore, you know, we start to learn about Amarath and the, you know, his, uh, you know, twins i guess or whatever like which would mm. like the the dragon and the demon and the witch <laughs> or the, yeah so like his mo oh. mother's a witch and stuff so like the thing is is you start to learn more about amarath and then you start to wonder like oh shit is like merit like Mer amarath and like reincarnated and that mm. is thalia like the amarath's like lover oh. like Ooh, mm -hmm. you know there is he kind of plays she kind of plays a witch i guess in a situation and then i'm assuming at some point he's going to be able to control a dragon because yes. he already he yeah he's commanded them but like on a level to where i'm talking like maybe in the next one he's riding a fucking dragon i would not i would not like, doubt it i will let's get into that for a second because yeah. honestly i don't know what your thoughts and feelings are about mm -hmm dragons in fantasy love it i mean i know that they are very much like uh you know it's like almost a trope right like mm -hmm. especially back in the day it's like if you you thought of fantasy it was wizards and dragons and shit right so yeah but for whatever reason i actually don't necessarily really enjoy dragons um oh really in my fucking fantasy i don't know what it is <laughs> but like but uh when it's done right i guess yeah. i do because i loved the dragons in this book uh mm -hmm. the, obviously the first one the crazy battle but then you get into the yeah. one that he's actually communicating back and forth with towards the end like i love that exchange and it really yeah. maybe was like yeah dude this dragon shit is awesome <laughs> Yeah, he has to negotiate with the dragon. Like, okay, which, okay, I, I'm gonna kill somebody. Just, just pick one, and then I'll go. And he's <laughs> like, 
fuck. <laughs> like, <laughs> this isn't just your yield, your average dragon. <laughs> yeah, these are not your normal dragons. These are, these are great <laughs> grim dragons. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure what my hang up with dragons is, but I guess uh, Anna Smith Spark definitely mm-hmm. started to uh, peel back some of that and make me go, okay, maybe maybe I nice. do like dragons in my, fil- yeah. in my fantasy. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I know for me personally, I get hyped anytime there's a dragon snuck into the story. All right. So where, where the fuck were we just at? Dragons. And dragons. How much, how much you love them. <laughs> yes, I love dragons. You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, people, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I have enjoyed, there have been stories I've enjoyed dragons in. I just, I mm-hmm. guess there's something about uh, them being, I guess, more than just, I don't know. I don't know what the fuck it is, dude. Maybe it's just like I've, I had too many dragons. And yeah, uh, maybe I need, I need fantasy without dragons. I grew up That's like, fair. you know what I mean? In the 80s and shit. So mm-hmm. it was like everything was dragons. Dragons, yeah. dragons, dragons. Yeah, I didn't have that, I think. So maybe that's why I'm more excited. You know, For dragons. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> dragons, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you, you know, there's a there's a fucking pretty brutal dragon scene in the land fit for heroes that I really mm. enjoyed. So once again, I guess, you know, I like them. I just I like them, I guess, better when they're fucking just gnarly death machines that <laughs> as they should be. <laughs> yeah. I don't like that's friendly they... <laughs> dragons, I guess. I don't no. know. <laughs> Yeah, you don't want to say maybe that. that's here's my a, thing. <laughs> here's a dragon, but all it does is go swimming and fly through the sky sometimes. And it's it likes, like, well, what's it likes the point? long walks on the beach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. no, no, no. Anyway. All right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Let's really back in. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, back to it. Um, how do you, how do you feel about like the overall, I guess, uh, world building and lore here in book one. You know, I mean, obviously we covered stuff. You know, there's a god, Amaranth. She built some history there. We've got, mm-hmm. you know, mythical creatures like dragons in this world. You know, there's obviously, you know, a long history of uh, political backstabbing and whatnot, you know, mm-hmm. in, in, within the empire. Uh, just, yeah, there's a lot of there's stuff there. So much crammed into this and in each part of the book, because early on she establishes, I like, we basically zoom in on Sore Lost. You know, we're all in this big city and she's just kind of telling you, look, here's how the politics work. Here's how the religion works. We see Talia, Talia and then we have, you know, mercenaries. So we know, you know, what kind of bad guys and good guys and all that out there. And in that first city, we get, you know, wizards are performing in the street for entertainment, but they're also sitting at the right hand of the king ready to defend his life. Like you see that contrast, like they're used this way and that. You also see the dragon and it's so much is crammed in the beginning and then they go and they travel and you can see the smaller towns. But meanwhile, they've always kind of talked about sore lost and it's beef basically with other big cities. Right. And, and then eventually by the end of it, you get to the islands and you can kind of see like, ah, this is where, you know, a lot of power lies Mm -hmm. and uh, Merith gets taken back there and you can kind of see, you can kind of see where he fits into that. And yeah, just they cram a lot as far as the religion, the mythical creatures, the cities. I think Anna Smith Spark does a great job of painting a picture. And yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I totally agree. You know, it's it's very cliche to say, but to, to some, like some of her like world building elements did kind of remind me of Tolkien. Mm-hmm. I feel like okay. it's just especially maybe too when I look at the map and stuff as well like it just mm-hmm. kind of brought me back to reading the Silmarillion a bit mm-hmm. um, but I know a lot of people were comparing her to uh, Baker uh, but I didn't get that really that feeling at all I got very much her own like I felt like this is a, a writer that has very much her own uh, style of writing but some definitely like she had some just great world building elements that I guess, like I said, like kind of going back into that deal, like, you know, my deal with dragons and this and that, but Mm -hmm. she kind of brought a lot of this stuff that maybe I thought was tired and played out and, and, you know, has it sprinkled throughout this whole book. And I enjoyed every bit of it. You know what I mean? Like she has great, like uh, she's got a good, I feel like she's got some classical style of world building mixed with this new, like edgy fucking style of her own. Absolutely. She, she flips some tropes on its head for sure. There's a thing with Merith where it's like normally you get the chosen one, 
he's the chosen one to bring death and destruction to the world though instead yeah. of saving it yeah <laughs> like, yeah yeah just and, and that makes it more interesting it's yeah, like i really really loved merith i was so blown away with how much i enjoyed that character because it, like there's a lot of my logical brain that was like no like the, fuck this dude like he, he's yeah. a terrible person <laughs> he's horrible and yeah and he just like mo <laughs> like and he's like all emo and tormented mm -hmm. and like like all yeah. this stuff i nor probably maybe make fun mm -hmm. of even but like nope yeah. i'm just like dude i dig this fucking kid man like yeah. i can't wait to see what he fucking does next <laughs> like, love him or hate him yeah. you can't look away <laughs> like, he is the beautiful just... train wreck you have got to yeah. watch <laughs> absolutely you want to take a minute just to talk about <laughs> how violent this dude is <laughs> yes. like okay so okay he kills the dragon that's that's the good guy thing and then yeah, we you're see... almost like pumped up you're like cool yeah, yeah fucking marriage he's, right he's a badass hero you know he's gonna be somebody yeah and then these guys try to rob them when they're first in sore lost and he murders the fuck out of the dude <laughs> and it's like uh, the other two people he's with, they kind of fight off their attackers. He's like, yeah, I got stabbed in the shoulder. But then they ran off once they realized it was going to be a fight. And they look over at Merit. And Merit is just fucking stabbing his guy. And he's like, what? <laughs> and they're like, you didn't need to kill him. They were running away. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and you just kind of see how violent <laughs> this dude. And you're like, damn. <laughs> he enjoys this a lot. <laughs> yeah. that's the, And that's one thing that I was like, Okay, here's the deal. He's a tormented guy, right? And but then, like you said, like you start seeing like his actions, um, and he seems to be very, very comfortable with stabbing, killing, maiming motherfuckers. Like that doesn't seem to be his torment in a way. So like you're like this no. dude's always brooding, but obviously he's hey, he's not worried about killing motherfuckers. Like that's not what he's mm -hmm. brooding over. <laughs> No, he's Which brooding. Way, yeah. To me, makes him like I'm like, what the fuck, dude? Like this guy is crazy. <laughs> yeah, and then especially once they go into they they complete their job and they go into the castle and he's just slaughtering people and he's just getting lost in the moment, like he's in love and he's just bathing in the blood and it's just so enjoyable. You can tell the man has bloodlust, real yeah. bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and then I love. I shouldn't say I love. Um, it's okay. I thought it was really interesting <laughs> that <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is love. a safe place. <laughs> um, I thought it was really interesting when they needed to murder a family to find a place to sleep for the night. And yeah. they all kind of looked at Merritt like, <laughs> like, you got this? And he's like, give me the best bed. And then he just goes and does it. Yes, like, dude. Damn. Like, I'll just, I'll murder this whole family. Yeah, I'll but do it. But you're giving me the best bed. Yeah, like that. <laughs> like, <laughs> fucked up. Like they, fucked at up. that point, they, they just accept it. Yeah, this is his. This is his forte. We'll let yeah, you. This uh, is our psycho. Go ahead. <laughs> 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 you handled that part, <laughs> and then they, then he murders the whole family, including the baby. And then yeah, it's dark, man. It's just like wow. It's I didn't know how far they were gonna go, and I was like, oh yeah, she went there. Okay. I guess another yeah. thing I do like that what she did with his character is that she did make him like basically he's a drug addict, like an alcoholic drug addict as well. Mm -hmm. Like tr as like that's how he Merith copes with whatever yeah. he's tormented with. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like because we don't know like throughout this, just like whatever is tormenting him is to the point where it's you know he's fucking got to do drugs and just fucking zone out and become a fucking shell of a man you know kind of deal at yeah, times he just has to burn away all the feelings completely numb himself with their drug i guess it burns you literally you know from the inside out and you don't see that a lot in fantasy that, that's yeah. another thing like it's bringing some real world shit to a fantasy story and i love that yeah because a lot of times like it's like oh okay this guy he's had a few bad days and we feel bad for him. No, this guy has had some real shit happen to him. You know, he lost the love of his life and he, you know, is addicted to drugs and killing. <laughs> and, you know, he has a lot of demons inside. He's literally part demon. And so, man, I just, you could throw him in any situation. You could drop Merit in any story, in any scene. And I wouldn't be able to look away because he's that chaotic and that interesting. Yeah, absolutely. That absolutely. Now he does have, we get those like uh, flashback sequences basically throughout the story, which are kind of giving us little bits of insight, right? Into the character of Merith. Yeah, right. Uh, we definitely, yeah, it shows like, okay, this is why he's brooding. This is at least part of the reason, you know, yeah, his family threw him out. 
because you know his uh, what do you call it? God, what was the guy's name? Karen Karen. Yeah. You know, he dies, and you know he's grieving over it. He's like, man, this is the person he loved a lot, and then I'm trying to remember. Does he? He, was he the one who actually killed him on accident? I'm trying to remember. It was yeah, a- yeah, yeah. That's what you kind of get. You get hit with that. Like he's mm. like, because it slowly kind of feeds you like bits and pieces. And then towards the end, you realize that he's the one that stabbed him. Yeah. And then, yeah. So it's like, so he, his own problems killed the person he cared so much about. And then, so that's eating him alive. And then you have somebody like Dahlia to kind of bring this new love into his life. And bring out just briefly, just glimpses here and there of a better person of, you know, oh, yeah, you know, you know, what? maybe I should get my shit together and I can rule and I can be king. And then, of course, he takes it too far and he's like, and I'll make everyone bow to you and I'll make yes. oh, they're, they're, and he just, <laughs> but like, I'll make it rain blood. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. can't ever just, <laughs> he doesn't oh, do anything uh, small. <laughs> Maris. <laughs> go big or go home. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. And, uh, is there something that you feel that stood out just like what was the biggest standout moment for the book like in a positive way for me i think going along this whole time uh, i was like okay you know this is kind of a cool fantasy story there's absolutely the grim dark protagonist that i want it but at the end the descent into madness the the whole he gets captured by landra and then you know he just kind of does nothing until one of the servants basically inform her she has to let him go and then that guy makes a deal with him and is like hey look i'll support your claim to the throne if you help me go up against your father and him going up against his father i thought was going to be like here's this big siege like lord of the ring style you know this army is going to come down no everybody just loses their shit goes crazy starts killing each other as soon as the battle starts and he loses him, himself in the moment and because he has that amrath blood in him it makes everybody go crazy. And just reading that, I've never read anything like that. Just the, the madness and the violence and you just see it and you see it from Thalia's perspective and you see it from uh, Tobias, who's on the other side, you know, like with all the terrified soldiers. Mm-hmm. And then it's just, oh, that is such a, a powerful ending. It just, just as far as style goes, you know, not even like some complicated storyline or anything, just the tone and the way it's carried out, the execution is just <sighs> great. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Honestly, that moment that you're talking about, like that battle, like the last time I think I had felt like that kind of like visceral darkness in a battle scene was probably King of Thorns, uh, the very, very end of King of Thorns, man. Mm-hmm. Like when Jorg basically comes out and just fucks shit up and then and, well, that's a whole yeah. other deal. I don't want to fucking yeah. spoil that in case anybody. That's true. I, I was going to bring up how how he wins his duel. Yeah, yeah, yeah but uh, I'm not anyway, get into yes, it. I mean, there's some very like just great grim dark descriptions in there. And th- when I was reading that, like that ending, man, I was mm-hmm. like, dude, this is this is fucking grim dark. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Like, this is so good. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it does, and it hit. It's like a laser beam pace at that moment too, though. I mean, it's just like mm-hmm. wow. <laughs> there we go we're going yeah and Blood's like you flying, said bloodlust yeah uh, that's a great w- uh, way to to describe it you're literally reading these like these moments of pure bloodlust and it is just gnarly um yeah it definitely yeah. got like i said this it got my attention it got me revved up yeah to get back in, people say- to, to carry on into book two um it because also too like i think it kind of this is like coming off of like the love story kind of part of the book as well. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you're, now you're getting into the, like, you know, the family history, you got a new chunk of world building when we hit the Island and now you get this crazy motherfucking battle. Yeah. And then grimdark is always such a funny thing to try to describe. Yeah. But this, this is, it satisfies that if you're ever looking for it and you're confused about, you know, some stories are on you know borderline. This is absolutely what you're looking for, I think, when you want a grim dark novel. Yeah, then that's and how then, I feel about it too. Is like when I thought of like when I originally discovered grim dark, it was like I was literally trying to find. I was just trying to find the darkest of dark fantasy. Is what I, you know, what I mean. I was like, what's the darkest yeah. motherfucking story? I want to know the grittiest goddamn fantasy books, and that's how mm-hmm. I found grim dark. You know what I mean? That's honestly how I found Prince of Thorns 
which I honestly, just like I do believe that Prince of Thorns is one of those books that it's like, this is grimdark. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Like, this I know is, that we're, God, we might get so satisfied. Stuff, but, but absolutely, Prince of Thorns is fucking grimdark. And so yeah. is the Court of Broken Knives. I totally agree. Yeah. Like, after that's I, why, by, after I finish this, you know, and I'm not such a huge fan of being like, oh, it's edgy fantasy. But at the same time, I'm like, it is edgy. You know, it's edgy as fuck. I love the edgy fantasy. You know <laughs> like, I, mean? I love edgy shit. It's just... Yeah. And this this book is edgy is all hell. And I really yeah, I'm super stoked about it. Real quick. I just want to touch on one thing that I noticed about since we brought up George for like half a second. So let's bring up this line really quick. So there's one line back in chapter 10 where it says Amrath. By the time he was 10 years old, he'd killed a man. By the time he was 20 years old, he'd conquered an empire. By the time he was 30 years old, he'd conquered the world, the greatest and most terrible of all the lords of Irlas. It makes me think Amrath and Ancrath sound a lot alike. And <laughs> I don't know if that was like a shout out, like if there's something, if this is Could a total like, con conspiracy theory, <laughs> but like maybe that's a little nod to Ancrath than just, how he, you know, when he was a young boy, you know, he killed a man and then at, by 20s, he conquered a kingdom and then the world. But that was just something that stuck out to me that I was like, hmm. There's also there's also the Lich Road on, on the island. And I thought yeah. that was the one that stuck out to me. I was like, is this a mm -hmm. nod to Broken Empire? I was like, mm -hmm. I think this is a nod to Broken Empire. <laughs> yeah, and there's the character named Rate, which is like almost reminded me just the sound is almost like Reich. But that's it's a little bit of a stretch. Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm I'm reaching for sure. Yeah, sure. But yeah, reach but away. Seeing, yeah, <laughs> but seeing where this story is going to go, if this all happened and he's you know taking down armies in the first book, I don't know. Is he going to take over the world in the second one? And Talia has to try to stop him. Slow or, his roll a bit, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, because that's the closest thing to a good person he has near him right she's that's the, the only one it's the only hope you have of like Merith not going full boogie into the darkness and just fucking everybody up yeah and seeing that, like going into the second book because there's so many moments here where we're like damn you know this is a violent dude what moments are we going to get like that in the second one? Oh, Jesus you know, who, Christ. Yeah. How does this get amped up? Uh. <laughs> who gets killed? Who is, you know, is Tobias going to last? <laughs> you know, is, maybe. Yeah, maybe not. Right. I mean, you know? he might be he might be there to like set the stakes. Who knows? Ooh. Yeah. yeah I mean, I don't think she's going to be afraid to kill anybody, uh, honestly. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I'm just trying to predict. This is, normally, I can get a good idea where the story's going. Right. Where the story is going. But in this one, it's so hard. I, I can't tell. I, I don't know. This one started out like a, a mission, and then an adventure, and then madness. This is such a hard one to try to predict. I have no idea where this can go. Yeah. It's going to be violent. That's what Absolutely. I know. Absolutely. The one, you know, out of all, like, the, the like, povs and you know threads like the one that might have started like the coldest for me was the orhan one but i have to admit when by the time it ended and that kind of goes into my like prediction because i really feel like we're gonna start to get like this lover's quarrel because we mm -hmm. know like from fallen orhan he's gay but he's got to like put on the charade you know with his wife and everything but you know we know about like the jealous lover stuff and whatnot you know and the whole mage attack and everything that happens with him um yeah. you know it's almost like i feel like as the reader you can kind of be like oh shit like his lover pretty much put the fucking mage hit out on him right like mm -hmm. um i don't think it says that but i mean i'm pretty sure that just alludes to that um yeah and I, I almost Draft. wonder if we're not going to get like some crazy, like backstabbing, you know, lovers quarrel mm -hmm. like deal there in Sorlost where they're just trying to fucking hire people to kill each other nonstop. Yeah. I don't know. And it's like, where's that? Where does that lead to? It's yeah, like, because it, so I mean, they, like, they kill each other. So Merith is over here conquering islands probably by the second one. And then, so back in Sorlost, why are we still following Orhan? What is, will the second story just, or the second book just be him? kind of taking out his enemies and controlling sore lost is the third one will he play a part in maybe taking out merit in the third one maybe he builds an army right maybe because i'm just trying to figure out where where does his story tie in 
you know? Well, because he's kind of running shit help. in Sore Lost, right? Yeah. Because after the king dies, mm. like they're kind of like, he's kind of left in a position of authority and power, correct? So yeah. Just like, yeah. Fuck. He's basically, I mean, the king's the king's the king, but he's he's running shit. Yeah, you know, and uh, so it's like so. I'm assuming maybe he'll build up an army and try to fight Merit at some point. Maybe I'll see. <laughs> yeah, we'll find out. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Do you? Uh, when, when are you planning on getting into this one or the next one? I can start it whenever. I mean, I'm juggling a few books right now. Yeah, me too. But- I'm trying to finish off my Broken Empire reread and my uh, Red Queen's War like tag along kind of deal. Um, okay. But I'll, yeah, and also I also I got uh, Baker's Aspect Aspect Emperor coming up soon too because everybody's like on me about that one. So uh, yeah, I wanted to like I start. That's the thing. I got to start buttoning some of this stuff up. But I mean, I just started this one mm-hmm. and I'm not trying to uh, slow down on it too much. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. hopefully be getting into book two either you know late this month or early next month mm-hmm. okay yeah i can i can start probably at the end of the month i'll yeah. break into it i think that's the funny thing about when you join booktube it's like i always considered myself a reader and then you find out all these thick amazing books that like you need to read now yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah i said oh oh you like that well here's 10 more just like and it's like oh man and i love it and i want to dig into it but there's so much yeah 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 before i started a channel i had like a list of maybe like 20 books and that was like for the rest of my life (laughs) yeah i was like like, reading a couple for the rest now i'm like oh shit (laughs) (laughs) yeah i got fucking tbr so goddamn Mm -hmm. long oh jesus christ yeah this time i just made a yearly tbr and i said i want to get to these books this year yeah. And that's it. Not I mean, to put too I, much pressure. <laughs> yeah, I got a lot of fucking series started last year and I continued into mm-hmm. it this year. And I'm like, I gotta stop. I gotta stop mm-hmm. fucking starting new series. I gotta finish some I, of this. I have shit. the same problem. I gotta finish some I'm of this just, shit. Dude, I started Gardens of the Moon in January. This last month I started The Blade Itself and The Rage of Dragons. <laughs> and it's like they're all good. You know, so it's like what what series do I put down to focus on the other ones, you know? It's just like <laughs> Dude, tell me about it, brother. Yeah, man. I mean, other than that, this is great, man. I, I'm glad that you kind of like signed on to do this discussion. Like I said, there's not a whole lot on YouTube as far as like people covering this book, but it's very well loved within the grimdark circles. So I'm just trying to maybe put a little bit, shine a bit more light on another piece of darkness. So I appreciate you doing this alongside with me. I appreciate you being the, the fucking mm-hmm. beating me to the punch. You know what I mean? Honestly, it was the like, one and only time ever. <laughs> yeah, <I was> like, <laughs> but well, I'll take it. it. Like, dude, I just, I hope that, you know, mm-hmm. people get out there, read this kind of stuff and, you know, get their opinions, mm-hmm. their thoughts, their love or hate for the books out there. It just, I think this kind of stuff needs a little bit more attention. You know what I mean? And that's what I feel like this discussion will help um and uh you know not only that just help motivate me to keep continue on with the series it's nice having somebody else you know what i mean oh, for to, sure uh, to talk all this shit with because a lot of times mm-hmm. after reading a book it's like i can do a spoiler free deal but it's like when i start to move on mm-hmm. to the next book it's like all i want to do is talk about that one fucking scene in that one book oh, but, you know yeah I mean? especially with a book as violent as this you yes, have those exactly where like, you you look up and you're like did anybody else just see that? Like it's this just funny. happened. I need to tell somebody. <laughs> and that's uh, thanks for having me on. Cause this yeah. is one of my favorite things about the bookish community, being able to just sit down and have a talk between fantasy fans. It's awesome. Yeah, absolutely, man. And I know that there's uh, you know, a bunch of people that are running channels that are all kind of like all getting ready to end uh, reading the Broken Empire trilogy, and I'm hoping to get you in on that too. I'd love to start a big ass discussion about. Uh, oh, that'd be awesome. You know, uh, the Broken Empire. You know, whoever we could get, you know, that'd be fucking great. I think that's another yeah. one that's. You know, obviously a lot of people know about it, but I love mm-hmm. to know like what people's like first feelings and thoughts are coming off of that because I remember mine years ago, mm-hmm. and that that fucking trilogy fired me up so much Man, you know what i mean i love that I, trilogy I, yeah i would love to capture some of the those moments you know what i mean like in a discussion mm-hmm. so you know that's something definitely i'm interested in and i'd love to have you on for that one brother for sure that'd be awesome sweet 
So, all right, guys, that's about all we got, you know, before my kids tear this whole motherfucker <laughs> apart. So, <laughs> all right, guys, yeah. thanks for stopping by. Uh, like I said, we'll have the descriptions for those reviews down in just down in the description. Um, and yes, check out David's channel, everybody. All right. Peace.